Welcome everyone to the first lecture of the In Conversation series this semester. My name is Annie He from the second year class here at Cooper. It's a great pleasure to have with us today Nima Javidi and Julian Palacio. Nima Javidi is a partner at the Ja Architecture Studio, Toronto-based atelier that addresses problems on iconography, geometry, form, tectonics, and how these issues can be in relation to the context of our architecture, whether a regional context or a global one. Julian Palacio is the founder and principal of JPAS, a New York-based architecture office established in 2014 with an interest in probing architectural form in relation to fundamental questions of use, structure, and local material practices as a form of knowledge and cultural production. Both are currently among the second year design studio faculty at the Irwin S. Chan School of Architecture at the Cooper Union, along with Stephanie Lin. This fall semester is their second collaboration and attempt to establish issues of typologies um, as the focus of their teaching research. We will start with a brief presentation by Tian Yao Sun from the third year, and we'll have two 20 minute presentations by Nima and Julian followed by a conversation on the topic discussed. We will later invite the audience to participate in the discussion. You can either form questions in the chat as we go along or join the conversation when it's time. And now I leave it to Tanya. Oh, so, uh, hello, uh, good afternoon or good midnight if you're in my time zone. Uh, so this is a, let's say a special presentation because Nima and Julian asked me to lay a a contextual presentation for the topics they talk about so that they don't have to repeat uh, the so-called contextual knowledge. Um, well, well, I'll keep this as short as possible. <clears throat> so um, the, the topic of today's presentation is going to be uh, two perspectives on typology. Um, and I'm, I'm here to lay a groundwork for the, let's say, the discussions of typology in a very short, uh, short history. Uh, kind of narrative. Um, and this is going to be based upon an opposition's article by Rafael Moneo. It's almost this canonical, uh, let's say, uh, both a factual collection and the comments of how people had commented. Uh, as they conceptualized and commented and transformed this idea of typology in the discourse, it's not to say that typology um, was not, uh, let's say, uh, active in the work before its conception. It's simply being formed at a certain stage and being discussed more and more later on. So uh, Monel begins the text with a very crucial question. He says that uh, an, an work of architect, uh, and work of architecture is inherently linked to the idea of the type. Uh, and it, his reason is twofold. One is that uh, an architectural object is necessarily characterized by its uh, uniqueness. Uh, it cannot be substituted by any other objects. Therefore, it's, it resists classification. But at the same time, uh, architecture as also, you know, it has this production aspect. Um, it's also, it also has this kind of essence of repeatability. So it seems to be, there seems to be a tension between the classifications desire and the unique desire, uh, if you want to call it that. So here is uh, Jess, uh, Jesse Reiser's Just Architecture, where he, uh, he lists several projects in them, let's say, um, in a very brief way, characterizes only by one word like surface or rotnet or holy. Um, there are many other aspects of uh, classification, but this suggests how contemporarily we're still using this way of uh, thinking, uh, regardless of whether typology has entered the discussion explicitly, it's always there implicitly. So what's very interesting is that um, we, sometimes we'll only be able to think about the individuality of a certain work by putting them into groups. So classifying them by finding their commonalities is uh, one step towards looking at their uniqueness in certain situations. And that paved way for uh, how typology had developed. Um, and what's very interesting also at the fact that, uh, I'll, I'll show this animation for like a little bit, if you can see it's moving. Um, it's a fractal animation, this is like, this idea where you zoom in, uh, you always kind of see a, a bigger resolution, a bigger picture. Uh, somehow typology worked uh, a similar way. It's just not infinite, right? So when you're, when you're at the urban scale, you might look at blocks uh, and their typologies in terms of plan, plan poche, and you look inside, you see 
different elements that can be, again, categorized. And inside, again, you can see architectural elements. You can classify all the columns, all the kind of walls, arches. So there are layers of typology. And we're concerned um, with certain scale. And it has to be looked at at a certain scale uh, to be understood. Otherwise, it becomes this infinite, uh, let's say not infinite, but it becomes a multi-layer thing where it's hard to untangle. So another thing that I think is crucial to this, con uh, this the context of this conversation is that type is not only an, a classification uh, method, it's also a method of designing. So that's one of the reasons that I think Nimas and Julian's and, uh, and Stephanie's studio starts with, uh, you know, a given, um, something that's very um, representative of that type, an instance of it. And then you start to manipulate it. And that's a process of production from the idea of transformation. And <clears throat> the next, we'll just go through, you know, well, how Moneo, you know, very meticulously go through certain, um, you know, development of the typological discourse in, you know, uh, in the Western architectural history, because since it is uh, very much a Western concept in a way. <clears throat> so, so the first one, uh, l let's say at least uh, the one we want to mention the first is uh, Gatomir de, uh, de Concy. Uh, he's a, a French, let's say, um, an architecture uh, scholar, archaeologist, and pol uh, politician, and he writes about this idea of the type being something that you can repeat, um, but uh, get very different results from it. So he separates this idea between um, a model and a type. So a model is something that's quite fixed, it's repeatable, it's easy to follow, but the thing is rigid. You cannot make more than uh, you, two different buildings from a type. Uh, from, a, from a model, but a type is different, where you, it, there's a certain um, flexibility. And, um, but one thing that uh, uh, Gatomir had thought about type is that it's a priori, instead of, uh, instead of uh, reasoned or deduced, is something that came before, um, let's say a primitive hut of some sort. There's a lot of things that predetermined it. But this idea of, you know, opposition between the model and the type to, its, to the extent of its specificity, specificity and uh, variation goes on to be carried out in uh, Précité le Somme by um, uh, Jean-Nicolas Louis Durand uh, at the École Polytechnique. Uh, is another school uh, in, in, in France uh, that I would say, you know, it, it, you know, it's separate from the Beaux-Arts, but it will quickly develop into a, a system where Paris becomes this center of distributing classical or uh, neoclassical knowledge. And, and Durand form, formulated this whole pamphlet about how do you, um, you know, uh, constitute a solution to an architectural problem by juggling the pieces, the idea of composition in there. Uh, what's interesting is that he never mentioned the idea of a type. He uses the word genre. And in fact, uh, we don't think that he is using, let's say, genre in the way of type because he clearly is using pieces of, let's say model, because you reconstitute it at, a, at the scale, but he never goes on the question and say, why the core has to be circular, or why a column has to be round, or, or it couldn't be another shape. Things like why, um, you know, why the accepted givens are, are, are as they are. Um, it's more of an application book, and it's also because it's an engineering a college. Um, but it, it, not only does it produce a variety of buildings that uh, suggest types, uh, the rotunda, the, the colonnades are used often and becomes such a, it, it becomes a rigid framework in which certain flexible operations are done and very efficient. But again, it missed this idea of, you know, what, what exactly is this, you know, diagram of the type? Uh, what's the, what, what does this flexibility lie beyond juggling pieces in composition? Right, so then we go to the modern movement. If you think of, you know, um, <clears throat> if you think type in the middle, then, um, uh, model is the specific is the very specified version um, of developed from the type, whereas be becoming rigid. The other side is abstraction; uh, is is less tangible uh, and is less conclusive. And modernist starts to reject um, the thing that they they think is the type, which is the the model provided by uh, the Beaux Arts and the Ecole Polytechnique. So they go to the other extreme, which is abstraction. They rejected those previous types or models. And they start from, um, they rely on industry and they basically develop something that's called prototype. Um, and I think we all would agree that um, Domino is a type. 
um, it's a, it, it follows a lot of you know features of the type. So whatever they say in their discourse about whether it's abstraction or not, they're still just uh, you know producing type. Um, this here isn't showing three examples of you know the cross column, the I bean W section, and the corner column uh, by Mies, where you know this is how production um, starts to change the type of a of a certain part of the building, which has significant influence over the iconography of this architect and the type of buildings that he actually generates. <clears throat> in the postmodern thoughts, um, a, a lot of questions are raised about the idea of abstraction and the total brick with history. So, um, you know, uh, Alexander Klein in his uh, book, das Familie, uh, Design Familie House, uh, you know, recognized that there is a value to the historical city. There is no, uh, let's say, definite break with the past because uh, you can, you can, let's say, uh, you, you're able to modify and explore a type without accepting it as the inevitable product of the past. So you're not being ghosted by history. And then you, you have uh, Muratori and, uh, and Rossi situated in Italy, start to look at historical cities developing from an urban type and go into, um, you know, the city's configuration and suggest there's an eternity of type. There is always been there and um, its function becomes quite, quite in, independent from it. This is probably where type are known by most people, at least is how I know it. Um, but the discourse extend more, uh, much more beyond that. Argan was this great figure in writing about type, even though he's not an architect. Um, but he, he sort of pulls out or pulls back the uh, Katamiya's idea about a type to suggest that it's not a model. It's something that must be flexible, that must be uh, seen not as an icon, but rather as an operation or basis of a diagram. But he said. It was not a priori, but uh, a posteriori. So it's something to be to be deduced. There's no this primitive thing where uh, a lot of things are predetermined by function or by the evolution of, uh, of organisms, as they say. At last, we have Venturi, uh, where type is kind of an image, where you look at it from the outside, it looks like a house, but the internal organization that doesn't have anything to do with uh, what's really happening uh, you know, uh, on the outside. The type is like, it looks like a certain thing, doesn't mean it, it's, it's, it's that thing. This is what, a moment where type is thrown into crisis. At the end, um, you know, we have our own uh, Professor Vidler where he con concerned three types of type, uh, uh, three types of type, a uh, typology. One is the primitive type uh, typology where um, things are <laughs> determined um, a priori. Um, and the second one is the technological uh, uh, typology where, you know, Mies Corp rely on a certain system because that's how the industry can produce. And then he commented on the, the third type exemplified by Rossi where architecture have an autonomous dependence of type that's generated within itself. Uh, therefore, you, you don't have to justify type by the fact that it was technological or uh, anthropological. It is there within the architectural discipline. Um, it's kind of the autonomy discourse. So what, what is that all of, all of those has to do with this idea of you know, introducing a studio here is that Moneo asked a crucial question at the, last, uh, uh, at the last few paragraphs, which is kind of nihilistic. That is, the architectural object can no longer be considered as a single isolated event because it's bounded by the world that surrounds it as well as by its history. And only by, re only by he, he asked this question of, do we undermine the possibility of actually exempt uh, using the type in practice by making it into discourse. So to talking about it actually undermine our possibility of using it. Um, because as we see how Duhon had put it into a rigid frame and propagated it uh, through the zeitgeist of his age. So um, with this last image, uh, let's kick off with, I think you two can make an order, whether it's Nima or Julian, both are fine. Nima, do you wanna go ahead? Sure. Uh, because mine is almost an extension of, first of all, that was very good in Yang. It was more than a groundwork. You, as usual, you, uh, you did your more than the homework and it was very good. Um, so let, let me share the screen. And uh, so I thought it would be good as most of the people in the group are participants of this studio would be good to talk about the general theme of geometry and typology 
almost in the light of the set of experiments that we've been doing in our second year studio at Cooper. And, as, and also bring up some of the background conversation that was uh, you know, the basis of, of the exploration. So in a way, this was the starting, uh, it started with this grid, the grid of single room architecture as a raw ingredient for the setup operations to start becoming the project of the studio. And as you can see uh, from the grid immediately, certain uh, groupings and shared traits immediately stand out from, from tectonic ones to figurative ones. And then in our conversations, partly you know, it's, uh, in our conversation internally with also Nader, we always felt that that was last year, that was the first time we did it. So we felt uh, single room architecture does not have enough ingredients to, to bring up all the uh, thematic weights of typology and we have to look at actually uh, more of buildings. I, you know, I personally had some reservations just because of the messiness of dealing with parts, but this, this term was switched to dealing with religious architecture types. And again, we are very, we are very careful not to fall into the kind of Durand or Pevsner idea of creating catalogs, but we always deal with specific plans, which, which become uh, important ingredients for the work to, uh, that would go. And also and students can start establishing meaningful cross connections and realize the, the similarities and, and differences between, for example, the mosque, the hypostyle mosque, the four Ivan mosque in the middle of Iran and the single dome mosque with the portico of Ottoman Empire in Turkey. So those kinds of um, connection can be established, which is very meaningful for students. But more importantly, our, our interest was never um, purely uh, you know, teaching types or understanding historic types, but we were always in, interested in the question of uh, transformation. And we, we always liked the, this study of typological legibility when it, go, when it under, goes through uh, certain kind of transformations and to what extent things remain legible and to what extent you can produce new architecture and use it as a raw ingredient. And we had a technique. The technique was collage to explore the threshold of legibility, as I mentioned, of a type through the transformation. This was the first year, but, we, but it's also important to note that by, we also had a kind of our own careful, uh, geometrically precise collage. So it, uh, it did not have some of the, the casual nature of cutting and, and uh, connecting piece to get, pieces together. So for example, in this conic collage, as you can see the ingredients of, of a plan, uh, on, on the left side are carefully being reconstructed to create a composite, another organization on the other side. This is, this is not a plan, but it's a kind of, it talks about the nature of the collages that we've been doing that was different. But also we were not just re, you know, residing on plan and we were, move, you know, we were engaging section as well. Um, here I'm gonna talk about just uh, a set of experiments that uh, uh, Tin Yang talked about, but the body of work that deals, deals with the typology and history, but my interest is in the technique that they, that they deployed. And both, you know, it goes to the text of Bonneau and, and Wittler, but I'm interested, you know, in understanding what kind of techniques they had in, in revisiting those. For example, one of the techniques is maintaining again, and the, the techniques are almost similar, at some level are similar to the, to the operations of the studio. For example, in um, Venturi's uh, Trubeck house, you can see that Venturi is maintaining the elevation, is maintaining the image, and reworking the inner organization logic of a plan. So one of them is radically transformed, the other one is a strictly a kind of restrained. So that, that, that is almost like operating with one and not the other. And you can see the, op, the other end of, uh, of that game is, is Rossi in the uh, house project. He, in, the, in, in, you know, in 1970, he's doing the opposite. He almost takes the formal structure of one level of the plan intact with references to typological uh, courtyard houses, but it radically changes it in, uh, in section. So it creates PLOT that creates cross continuity at the base and the roofs uh, start to, to create another level of continuity on the roof, or CISA, which was slightly different, but he always had the kind of uh, contextual uh, 
understanding of type. His language was more abstract than modernist, but he always understood type, but he always carefully rotated certain ingredients like the entry from a courtyard pavilion that keeps, uh, gets pushed to the corner and transforms the whole up, you know, the inner working of a plan or the church, a symmetrical church, suddenly, you know, the seating of the church and the apse and the altar suddenly gets uh, rotated. So these kinds of techniques was something that, that resonates with the work of the studio. But um, I'm gonna also add, there's also one ingredient of the studio, which is, which is about geometry. And I wanna go to a, two sets of experiments because they go back to typology. One is the modernist that Tim Yang brought up and the idea that um, essentially modernists were interested in essentially um, early modernists, whose interest was to invent new architecture, not through its ties to history, but through its, uh, its connections to industrialized modes of production and mass production. So almost reinvent architecture, not through its connection to the city or past, but through technology. And you can find, so this is early modernism, but you can also see it in appearing in the 90s, again, but a bit, with a different lens. And that was the lens of, uh, topological, you know, computational uh, geometry, topological geometry, um, and also the engineering that was changing mass customization was uh, was appearing. And some of these practitioners were interested, like uh, you know Schumacher and Zaha. They were kind of recoding the the, the formal paradigm of space, the spatial paradigm of the time. But more interesting experiments was still typological. So they were looking at uh, the notion of continuity that was coming from the core uh, theme of topological geometry and they were exploring new types. The new types of, of let's say in Yokohama, in the FOA uh, Yokohama terminal, they were inventing the notion of a, of a terminal, of a C terminal. Or in case of Jusu Library, uh, OMA and, and Cool House are working with the continuity of floors to create almost a continuous path for the modern flanor to, to almost walk in the interior city of, of the building. And it was this desire of using both, uh, both new ways of thinking about geometry, but also the technology was at hand to suddenly reformulate the type as a building. And the building was, uh, was changing. But to be fair, in the case of the kind of second generation or uh, second generation OMA alumni, like Biarte in its, in its uh, good moments, he started using the geometric and formal paradigm, but also uh, tried to kind of carefully combine it with some of the historic types, like, like a kind of perimeter block that along the path of an eight figure, both in plan and section, can combine in a very sophisticated way moments of, of low rise, uh, you know, urbanity and kind of a gesture of a row, row housing in, in such a large infrastructural project. So th those were uh, the, uh, kind of a good hybrid experiment. So we've had experiments of, of typology alone. We've had experiments with, with geometry to reinvent architecture. We also had uh, good experiments of hybridizing the two. And the question is, uh, where can we go from here? And you know, what is there more to offer? And uh, obviously I have, I don't have answers to this, but I have some hunches that, um, that comes from the work that we're doing in the studio and also something that can be the future studio, but it's also some of the directions that I think is interesting to pursue. So one is, I don't think um, geometry has not exhausted its offering. But if we keep trying to uh, bring it in the service of a synthesis project on architecture of, of combination of formal excitement and functional responsiveness, we can never properly use its offering. So I believe in geometry as an autonomous discipline to be explored, sometimes it can offer it, uh, its inventions or uh, its offerings to architecture, but it's not necessarily as such. And one of the reason that I think VRK's projects are losing that, you know, the, 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 the immediate uh, impact or interest that they generated is because the, the exploration of, of geometry and form is not uh, putting anything new. So all of the other things cannot come in. So the engine is not working. So to me, we can learn from this work officially and wise, 
because the synthesis will happen, but we have to give it a suspension time. That work, like this work, that is a careful, fragile structure that is only stable long enough for, uh, for a photograph to be shot. So we need to allow for things that are not that stable to exist. We also need to understand that time has changed. Time has changed, so is understanding of our history. We live in the time of social, political, and econ economical uncertainty and upheaval. Regardless of where we land, we know that our present and past will not be read the same. So is our understanding of the known types and their respective rituals. So this is my favorite example of, 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 of that best depicts this condition that we are in. It's a female-led Muslim prayer performed in a neo-Gothic church in New York, where a ritual has complete, has complete dissonance with the axiality of the basilica plan and the, you know, the type that is accommodating it. And it's also with its very own history as a ritual. So we need to spatially engage with history so the new imagination would only be generated in meaningful friction with historic types and rituals and the project of architecture syntax cannot be purely generated from within. And the last one is, is when I was looking at this, I really more and more I like this house. And I feel that Moneo's description of it, which is saying, type is reduced to an image is not quite fair because the beauty of architecture is the moment you radically transform the, the plan, you cannot maintain the, the image as intact as, as you think. And an interesting montage has happened between the front and side that can, could never, and the, 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 the result is much richer as a, you know, of a beach house itself. So in revisiting some of the old techniques like montage and collage, we understand that they accommodated a degree of radical freedom that the new technology, like the new digital world that we live in, cannot afford. So those are my three uh, future directions that I think things can, can go and would be productive. So that was me. Um, so um, what, uh, what I will share uh, with you today is of course some, some personal thoughts on and observations concerned with this issue of the structure, but also its potential um, and relevance as part of, of a conversation on typology. Um, and thank you, Ting Yang, for the uh, very well articulated summary of, of Moneo's text. I think that that was a great as a, as a way of introducing the, the topic. Um, so my, my interest in bringing a structure into the conversation is, is motivated um, in part by a desire to, to expand on the, on the debate on type beyond the usual themes of, of a style and, and geometry. And also to explore perhaps uh, the ways in which uh, the tectonic can also play a fundamental role not only in the definition of types, but also in their transformation through the emergence of new spatial organizations. Um, well, uh, we are all very familiar with this slide, with this image of the primitive hop. And I'm included, I'm including this image here because I think it says something about uh, the role of a structure um, in the earliest definition of type. Um, even though it later on the pendulum has swung in the direction of, of abstract geometry and, and, and style, I think uh, there are several interpretations out there that uh, in the primitive hut, hut um, is basically the depiction of an archetype of architecture that is based on just the structure. When we see the, the trees, uh, the horizontal and the vertical members uh, portrayed here. And I think the same can be said about the relationship between the structure and the spatial organization of architecture in Doran's study of types, even if it's not completely explicit. But we see columns, arches, domes, and vaults, all which are structural elements as being part of the fundamental components of these catalog of, of types throughout the history of architecture. So a structure uh, has been uh, part of both the tectonic organization, but also the spatial organization of space. 
even though that uh, correlation has been has been lost somehow. On the other hand, of course, we have uh, you know the the texts about engineering and structures, uh, such as this one by Engel, in which there's also an idea about uh, cataloging types, the structural types, and the relevance in terms of uh, behavior and performance. But again, this is kind of a parallel discourse to the one in architecture because it is completely within the sphere and the realm of engineering. Um, but when we look back, for example, at uh, traditional types such as the basilica, it is uh, fair to assume that the formal and special organization of, of a building such as this one, of the basilica, is also the result of the structural logics. Um, the addition of the aisles next to the main nave can be considered, uh, of course, a mechanism to deal with the loads and the thrust that is generated by the long span of the nave. So the typology of the basilica as such is related also to very specific ideas about the structure, materiality, and the tectonics. And this is, of course, a, an interesting argument that I'm uh, argument that I'm borrowing in part from Christoph Weiser and Andrea de Plazis, that um, in which they describe the problem in architecture to go from a single room to an um, aggregation of rooms and spaces. And they speak about the role of structure and materiality as a mechanism that allow basically architecture to, uh, to grow either horizontally or vertically. Um, there are, of course, other manifestations of these ideas of type, even if they go back to the vernacular, like in the case of these Modif houses in Iraq, in which the act of construction and the means and methods through which these houses are built is basically the expression of the architecture and can be considered a type on itself. And so this connection between the, the construction and the reality of the construction and the type is, um, is, is explicit also in the text that uh, Monet wrote and which Kim Yang uh, read at the beginning, although I think this specific portion of it was not included in Kim Yang's description. And uh, I think it's, it's relevant to mention uh, the quote that I'm about to read because it describes uh, not only the architect's engagement with the notion of type as part of the design process, but also to uh, the connection to ideas outside the realm of geometry. So I'm gonna read very briefly this, this quote by Moneo. The design process is a way of bringing the elements of a typology, the idea of a formal structure, into the precise state that characterizes the single work. But type as a formal structure is also intimately connected with reality, with a vast hierarchy of concerns running from social activity to building construction. Ultimately, the group defined, defining a type must be rooted in this reality as well as in abstract geometry. This means, for example, that buildings um, such as, or building types such as the dome, which we are all familiar with, um, hide sort of a, a, a story. For some, for some people out there, the dome could be understood as a, as a single type. But if we look at the way in which these domes have been built throughout history from the Renaissance and the Baroque, um, for example, with the dome at, at Santa Maria del Fiore by uh, Brunelleschi, um, compare that against uh, domes that were later built, such as the dome for St. Paul's Cathedral or even the dome for the U.S. Capitol, we can see that these are actually three different typologies of domes because in one, um, in, the, in the last two, uh, there are in reality three domes that exist and the material of construction for the U.S. Capitol Dome, for example, is based on a steel structure. 
versus using uh, masonry as it was in the during the Renaissance and the Baroque. And in the case of St. Paul's Cathedral, is even more interesting because there's a, a, a dome in the interior that needs to obey, of course, to the ideas of proportions of the space. There's an exterior dome that plays a role at an urban scale, the scale of the city. But then there's this intermediate cone, which is built with brick that supports the exterior one, but also supports the lantern that is placed at the top. Um, so what I would argue is that uh, there's a, the, the active engagement with the structure as an architectural problem is perhaps a way to start rethinking the idea of type. And at the same time, it can also present opportunities for the emergence of new types. Of course, we are uh, familiar with the Cordova Mosque and how important the structure in this case is to define not only the initial mosque, but also to allow this system, system to grow over time and to have the capacity to receive e even uh, types that were alien to them. And I um, very much enjoyed this photograph of the roofscape of the mosque because it really brings uh, into the forefront uh, two different structural systems from different uh, times, the flying buttresses that are supporting the cathedral versus uh, the roofs that are covering the, uh, the arches uh, and the and the beams of the original system of the of the mosque. So what are what I think there could be in terms of dealing with uh, the structure and the transformation of types is perhaps uh, by looking at, at, at two things. One is um, how a structure can have the capacity to incorporate or register um, issues, variables, or contingencies that are outside the realm of the structure and that can be incorporated as part of it. As we um, see, for example, in the, in the castle, the Elphinstone castle, in which the thickness of the wall, the structure itself, uh, accommodates a series of rooms and spaces um, that allow it to have a function other than just being the, the structure. Something that I also um, pretty much enjoy in this drawing of, uh, or a diagram of the space um, from the movie being John Malkovich, in which if you remember there is, there is the mysterious seven and a half floor that is at a different scale and that seems to occupy the space between two slabs between the structure. And there may be another possibility in terms of um, charging uh, the structure with uh, a capacity to affect types. Um, I think this has to do more with an, uh, an ambiguity that the structure can have so that um, structures may uh, seem to behave in a way in which they don't really uh, behave or they seem to play with ideas of perception and, and um, relationship to a scale and experience to convey an, uh, a transformative kind of idea about what the structure could be in a building. So I'll start by, by looking uh, at a few examples which I think have uh, approached both of these ideas, the structure as a, as a space or as an element that can incorporate ideas beyond the structure itself, and also the kind of the, the ambiguity dealing with the structure as a as a system. Uh, so in the first category, um, we're familiar with uh, Wright's uh, Johnson Wax of his building in which the hypostyle hall uh, has been redefined by incorporating ideas of uh, light. So there's an, uh, a notion of the column as a type that goes beyond the support of the roof. But also the very famous Gymnasium Maravillas by Alejandro de la Sota in which uh, a problem that was presented to him by the uh, site itself, in which he had to dealt with two different elevations, gave um, 
the, gave birth to the idea of utilizing a trust system to not only support an extension of the roof to align with the upper elevation, but also to bring classes and, and activity within the space of the trust and uh, stopping the trust uh, short so that the sun and, and light could come into the space of the gymnasium below. Um, there are cases in which, of course, the structure uh, goes beyond ideas of program, uh, as is the case with Miguel Fisac and his experiments with the beam, precast beams uh, that are called the bones, in which the beams uh, themselves are not only a structural element, but they also incorporate environmental issues and environmental performance by dealing with rainwater collection and also uh, daylight by the manipulation of their geometry. Um, there's another case, uh, another project by FISAC, the Jorba Laboratories, specifically the tower, um, which is called the Pagoda, uh, in which the, the tower as a type is completely redefined. Although I will use this precise example to sort of speak uh, not only about the uh, FISAC uh, project uh, in terms of it, the structure, but also the, the implications of uh, a misreading of the, of the structure and the material here on his part. Because the actual structure of this tower is pretty conventional. It's a structure based on columns and beams. But the rotation of the floors uh, presented the opportunity to cast these rule surfaces that articulate the geometry of the tower, but that in reality are not structural at all. Uh, the structure is, again, a system of columns and beams that run through the different floor plates, but the skin of the building, which could be perceived as being structural because of its expression in concrete, uh, is revealing the section that's something that, that is not really it. And there is uh, more recent examples on how these ideas of uh, structure can reinforce narratives, can reinforce uh, fictions, or provoke the imagination by uh, challenging the assumed types of, uh, of a column, in the case of Olgiati, and how it will meet a slab. And I think in, in this case, uh, the provocation is successful because even though we may not be familiar with the field of structures as a discipline, even if we are not engineers, uh, all of us as, as human beings have uh, already kind of a knowledge about gravity and how loads uh, work just because of our own body or just because of our interaction with the, with the outside world. So every time that we uh, see things that doesn't really uh, fit within that uh, preconceived notion of, of physics and, and statics and mechanics, uh, there's a challenge that is intriguing and that uh, presents this idea of the ambiguity in, in the structural systems. Um, that has been explored in some cases and, and some of you are already familiar with a few of these images. Um, specifically in the work, I think, of Villanova Artigas and the uh, group of architects in Sao Paulo in the middle of the 20th century, in which uh, the use of reinforced concrete and pre-stressed concrete gave them the ability to rethink um, uh, usual types, not only of a structure, but also of architecture and introduce, uh, in the case of Artigas and his supports by the for the unheavy tennis club, the idea of attention or the expression of gravity materialized in the mass and the, and the volume of these supports that taper to a very narrow edge as soon as they are going to meet the ground and understanding the foundation of the building almost as coming up out of the, of the ground itself to receive the pillars in a very delicate manner. So the idea of having these very heavy buildings being supported by very uh, uh, small points of contact with the ground revealed attention and 
all of a sudden brought uh, relevance and importance to the structure. Beyond that, in the case of the Unheavy Tennis Club, there's also the desire to incorporate issues outside the realm of, uh, of the structure and the materiality of the building, in this case, by creating uh, a rainwater collection system inside the columns in themselves. So the, the, the columns are in some areas become actually hollow to allow the water to travel. The, that theme uh, was further explored in other projects, such as the Santa Paula Yacht Club, in which the supports are actually uh, hovering or floating above the stone wall and are just uh, touching these uh, three spheres of steel as the point of contact, almost negating, in a way, the, the possibility for the structure of the building to connect to the ground and levitate. And of course, um, the most famous project by Villanova Artigas, the School of Architecture and Urbanism in Sao Paulo, which presents also the idea of a structure that is very slender on the outside to receive a huge portico uh, versus an interior that reveals that the structure of the building is actually a series of uh, columns that are on the interior so that the roof is delivering to the outside and the pillars that we perceive in the exterior are actually doing very little work. And that challenge to the, to the assumed type of the column um, allow also to create a space that transform the type of an educational building by providing an open forum, an open uh, space, a plaza that connected to the outside of the building to the campus and that uh, permitted the building to be open 24 seven for the students to take uh, that space, to colonize that space with activities. I think another architect, of course, that has uh, challenged these traditional ideas of the structure and its role in the definition of types in architecture is Felix Candela, specifically through the use of uh, its umbrellas that in a very interesting way, specifically for the church of the Medalla de la Milagrosa, allow him to rethink the type of the, of the church by tilting these umbrellas, putting them on their side, lifting one edge, uh, creating this uh, marvelous composition of hypersurfaces that um, was not, in my opinion, um, was building, in my opinion, on the traditional type of a church with the side aisles and the main nave, uh, just that in this case, the structure was actually wrapping around them. And in the case of uh, the Uruguayan engineer Eladio Dieste, the, the, the simulation of having a uh, reinforced ceramic structure that floats almost as a carpet on top of the spaces allow him to create a series of types that were structural, uh, but that again challenge ideas about the expression of buildings, even if they um, not really participated in the creation of uh, different plans or different typologies in plan for the buildings that he designed. Um, so in the case of the Cristobredo church, the undulation of the walls, of these roof surfaces of the walls, plus the double curved bolts above the space, um, created a new um, type, a new language or a new vocabulary in his case that was deployed in many buildings throughout Uruguay. So the use of a type as something that can be repeated uh, was very much at play in the work of Eladio Dieste, except for a few cases that were, I think, idiosyncratic or that were special, such as the folded uh, roof for the Church of San Pedro, which is particular in the sense that it was not a new building, it was an existing building that uh, had been destroyed, so he was commissioned to do an addition to the building so there was already a footprint that allowed, that gave him kind of the, the geometry to work with. But other than that, there were a series of projects that gave him the opportunity to apply these types uh, several ways, redefining what we would think is a roof or what we would think is the surface 
of a building. Um, so to me, there's that idea that uh, by rethinking how uh, a structure can play a more active role in the definition of the expression of architecture, we can start understanding uh, not only uh, the potential of types, but also we can start imagining new uh, and future types um, as they are generated by not only the material, but the spatial organization that these types sponsor. Um, and I will end uh, there. Thank you so much. It's been, I think you guys go the kind of opposite way where Nima gave very little examples and then quickly walked through the certain, let's say, uh, pretty argumentative aspect of the teaching research. And then, uh, you know, Julian, you basically lay out more than half the presentation with, you know, copious amount of uh, works that are, um, you know, explicitly, uh, you know, very, very self, uh, self-explanatory in terms of structural type and, uh, um, you know, its transformation within history. So um, the next section will be uh, like a conversation. It's estimated to be 40 minutes. I think it, it depends on two things. One is when do we dry our mouth? Like when, when we can't talk among three of us anymore uh, and four of us with, uh, with also any. Um, and when, uh, let's say it shouldn't get too long because I think uh, audience might have a lot to chime in because it's, it's a lot of material even, even by them. So, um, I, I probably will start a first question, which is, you know, um, I think um, we missed, I, I think I missed in the, in the anthology of uh, typological discourse, uh, an important figure, which is Kuhas. Um, you know, specifically his, uh, 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 his uh, Jesu uh, library, where, you know, it's a domino, but then the slabs are uh, folded. So, the idea of the horizontality of the Corbusian type is totally gone. Yet, um, you know, the domino system, the vertical supports still are very crucial. I think it's important because of two reasons why is, one is, uh, uh, you know, Kuhas himself is very innovative in terms of, you know, rethinking about the existence type, exist, exist, the existing types that are not necessarily recognized by architects. Let's say his delicious, uh, always wrong, the Larry is New York, um, where you're looking at things that are, you know, uh, architects trained in the academy don't care to look at, and he made cases out of it. Well, in this case of the library, um, I think it's important to see that uh, geometry, when geometry is, is changed or is developed through paper, structure becomes radically challenged, where surfaces are not flat anymore. So uh, where do those, you know, uh, you know how, how, how do slabs become um, you know, where are the be where do the beams go? Or if you say they're not necessarily beams, uh, so it does it become a shell or things like that. So I think that's an example of things that are very much intertwined uh, with each other, uh, where type and um, let's say type is simultaneously affected by the same element of the slab, which radically changed the two aspects of it, which is structure and geometry. So uh, I'll just throw an example. Uh, I don't know, uh, you know. But he, that's an example of our agreement. Give us an example of our disagreement. Cause... Yes. Do you want disagreements? Uh, I don't know. I'm not here to. I like uh, it. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good example of how they are intertwined. And they, are, uh, they work reciprocally. Um, but the question is, do they always do that in, in concert to each other? Or are there moments that one is the engine and the other one is the function of, and, and can we think about those? I thought, I generally think um, that that's where things get uh, contentious and, and different perspectives arise. Because I, I think, think, go ahead, sorry. No, no, I was gonna mention maybe one example, if I remember correctly, by Kulhas or by OMA that I think maybe addresses kind of the, the challenge or goes in the other direction, if I remember correctly. I think it's the ZKM building in which it was, I think an exploration to have, excuse me, floors that are, in which the structure uh, spans the whole height of a floor to liberate 
the remaining floors for different programs and different configurations. So in that in that case, there's a more um, it's a different approach to to structuring and and and, and kind of the, the type of the building. They become disassociated in a, in a way. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I'm I'm thinking. Am where, I right or am I wrong? No, you're very right. <laughs> I, very right. I love that example. And I'm just trying to think about. Uh, it seems that neither geometry nor structure have direct uh, are there to change types. They can certainly do that, but you know, just because any of them is changing typological transformation doesn't happen. And I felt some of the examples that we like in architecture are either moments of a structural, uh, uh, moments of dance between geometry and structure that is quite uh, enriching for architecture, but they're not radicalizing type. They're not producing anything typologically new. So I think it's good to to separate that. And also, uh, it's important to say, uh, for typological innovation, it, at least the part of the, the, the structure that really changes uh, you know, architecture type is, are the ones that are, are the most available ones, like Maison Domino, like the idea of a, of a free uh, plan and, and you know, uh, uh, columns of, you know, a grid of columns and essentially flat slabs or ripped slab. That becomes a city like Athens or even Tehran at some level, but it may not be a great example of structural innovation, but it's a moment that the structural change or a systematic, a system of construction suddenly changes our understanding of typology completely. And those are the examples that we do not talk about much and trying to categorize what other things exist that don't fall in the, in, in our discourse, when we like to enjoy certain certain mo certain dance between geometry and art and structure, and and most of the times uh, it doesn't need that. Is it fair to say that? To say, especially in terms of in case of structure, like the, for example the Fisac uh, space that you showed, the open floor plan comes from the, the you know the beauty of you know comes from the. The, the structural capacity of the beams to create the free flow plan. But the fact that light goes there is an extra that really may not uh, affect, it does affect the quality of the interior space, but that type is not dependent on that. So the, the question of dependency, I think, matters. And what, what, what is the engine behind the other one? And I'm just saying, sometimes we like the reciprocal relationship between ingredients, but the engine is always the one that is careless about the other. May, may I ask a question? Please chime in. Um, and this is directly to all three of your points uh, and maybe just to uh, clean up some of the language that we're using or clarifying it at least. Uh, my sense is that the, the word type, uh, system, uh, diagram and party uh, could um, could stand to be clarified here uh, in, in one, and this could be a, uh, an intellectual difference we're, we're setting up here, but I, for one, would not uh, contend that the Maison Domino is a type, per se. It is a system, maybe. It is a kit, or, or, or many other descriptions, but in fact, precisely because it comes with a, a, a manual of operations, you can make the free plan become a basilica in, of sorts, uh, or a stoa of sorts, or, or many other typologies. So embedded within that kit of parts uh, is a different malleability than a normal typology would have. And so in that sense, um, the, the, the Maison Domino in and of itself is not the type, but it's, it, it, it's a kind of vessel to, to achieve it. The other thing that I was struck by, uh, and, and this is more to Nima and to Julian. Nima, let's say, by way of geometry, and Julian uh, uh, by way of structure. 
in the context of Nima's presentation, the, the role of geometry is transformative of the architecture, but not necessarily of the type. And therefore, it, at that moment, it qualifies as a mannerism, but not really a transformation of the type. Uh, similarly, but differently, in Julian's examples, there are many uh, in which um, structure has a vast impact on the building and, and its systems, let's say, but the type is, remains absolutely orthodox. Uh, and, and some of the candelas and diestes are, are, are almost uh, Catholic in their, in their strictness of orthodoxy. So uh, if I had one question to you is one, are you interested in a, in a slight clarification between what constitutes typology versus systems versus diagrams? And second, as an overall blanket question to you, at what moment do you know that you have a typological transformation? That is, if this is of any pedagogical relevance today, um, why are we talking about it today? And what is that moment of transformation when you know, aha, I've achieved it. This is not a mannerism. This is a, this is a whole new type for which there is no precedence. I guess I'll jump in first because later the, you know, our two speakers instead of me as moderator will speak a lot more, I'm pretty sure. Um, I think this problem of uh, Maison Domino as a instance of a type, as a means to an end to achieve a type is, you know, is pretty much uh, a, a, a perfect example of this dilemma of grasping what is type, right? How to express a type. In Nima's studio, we, uh, you know, he said that he wants to stick to the specificity of the buildings, but at the same time, when he's naming them in the in the PowerPoint, is not like this name of the church or name of the mosque, but rather a functional type name of it. What church? Uh, what kind of it? For what? Things like that. So that naming speaks to a generality that exists in there. So it's almost like the same thing. Obviously, uh, that we're we're talking about when we're saying um, the Pantheon, right? Or in a way, the Altus Museum by uh, by Schinkel. Um, it's hard to find another building that look exactly like that, but it seems to be this um, uh, this figure that's so exemplary that you can find uh, ghosts in many other projects. And Domino was very interesting because um, it's, exp it's expandability. You can always horizontally stack it up by increasing the thickness of the columns. You can always, you know, uh, not like vertically stack it up or horizontally expand it. So there's that kind of extension where it, you know, it takes on this industrial idea of, uh, of modernism. Um, I mean, it's, it's a similar idea for the umbra umbrella diagram of the hanging beings of Mies is just less expandable, let's say, or less applied today. So my, you know, my answer to the idea of, you know, whether Domino is a type or not, I would consider, uh, I would still think it is a type, and in the, in this in this way, the 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 system and the type is uh, is let's say um, is is pretty hard to entangle. As for the idea of a diagram, um, I think diagram is probably the easiest way to express a type. Uh, but it, you know, diagram as a reduction can always um, let's say um, exclude something. It, it might resort to reductionism, where you look at aspects of it, but not the other parts. And the things you're leaving out might be the key uh, things uh, out of the perspective. So I'll just end the discussion, uh, you know, the answers down to the two speakers for now. Should I, should I go first? Julian, you've been quiet, so you go ahead. Okay, I agree. Well, um, I'm, I'm just uh, thinking that if we need to speak about new types, um, there's, there's, there's the, the, you know, the way of thinking about new types as related to new functions or programs that emerge in architecture. Um, uh, throughout history, to what extent a new type has been always uh, preceded by kind of the desire to uh, incorporate a new activity that didn't exist before. Um, 
And if that's the case, I think the the structure sort of will support that desire to um, provide inhabitation for for a different program. Um, I'm, and, and this is this is a kind of a, a, a personal uh, um, point on it. Um, I think you cannot deal with the type or the geometry without dealing with its materiality and the structure uh, before. Um, I think there's there's kind of a a, a connection there that is difficult to break. You may have different structural typologies that don't necessarily affect the type of architecture or the structural systems that don't affect the type of architecture. But for a new type to emerge, I think it either needs to be provoked by uh, uh, technological development or um, a different um, structure system that needs to be part of it. Um, and I think that's, for example, the beauty of the, of, of course, Brunelleschi's dome in, in San Maria in Fiori, which it is a technical innovation. It is a new structure, uh, even though it may not alter the type of the of the church itself as a plan. Um, can can I probe your sentence a little bit closer? Because in the yes. in the introduction, you said that you know uh, when there are new functions and new programs, you know that there, there's a kind of will towards inventing a new type. My understanding from uh, Rossi to Moneo to to Silvetti is that. What is interesting about type, in fact, is that type is indifferent to program, to function, to character, and to iconography. That's precisely its power. If I also understood your uh, presentation, I thought that was what you were saying. You're saying, bes despite the fact that type is indifferent to function and program, et cetera, et cetera, it cannot be indifferent to structure. That's what I thought you were saying. Can you clarify that point? Uh, the second one, yes, it cannot be indifferent to a structure, the type or the type transformation. So it has to be a sponsor by, by the structure. And in relationship to the, to the first point, which is true, there's the, the, if we use type with no connection to program, there's more flexibility for its manipulation or its invention. But um, but have we seen any new types emerge um, in contemporary architecture? I guess I would pose that question. Uh, have we truly seen new new typologies emerge uh, that are not dependent on program or use? Uh, well, the big box. Uh, is a new, I don't know if it's a new type, but it is definitely a, a, a you know, a, a scale, a configuration, a type, if you will, that exceeds uh, any precedence. Uh, and so within which many configurations may appear, it doesn't conform to the strict definition of type in the way that the preceding generations may have wanted it to. And in that sense, within the big box, one can do many operations that give it orientation, affiliation, uh, and cultural depth. Uh, but I guess also, you know, when one thinks of the Hyatt Atria of the 1970s, and uh, that was thought to be maybe the extremity of those tower, the, you know, the atrium tower uh, was conceived of as a new type because no longer was the atrium associated with the Roman house, but rather the skyscraper all of a sudden. And so the hybridization of the skyscra skyscraper core in tandem with the atrium uh, gave birth to a new type. Uh, so there are moments where I think that these things happen. Uh, where either, as you said, a technology or, or a new 
uh, let's say, code and zoning ordinance produced extremities that cannot, uh, can no longer comply with, you know, known types in the orthodox sense that, you know, the, the scalar shift or the proportional shifts produce new conditions that uh, require essentially some kind of transformation on, you know, on the part of the architect. Which is also the case with economic pressures as well. I mean, the, the hybrid building may be the result of different uh, pressures coming from real estate economy and so forth to, uh, to, uh, to basically ask for uh, a structure to pack as many things as it can inside of it, producing that multiplicity of functions and uses that as a result um, uh, generates a new type then. So that's what I'm, I'm, I'm kind of thinking if basically all of those things that seem to be external to the discipline itself are the ones that could drive the invention of typology uh, in contemporary practice as understood today. I'm trying to think, because uh, some of these, I think that because the term type keeps sometimes referring to uh, the kind of uh, characters that I think Nader mentioned, that I think in all of those examples, Rossi, Monel, and Venturi, we are talking about relationship to, uh, it's, in, it's, it's based on the lexicon of a, of, of a Western city, of a historic city. So that is different than, than when we refer to the organizational logic of a building whether to transform it or to incorporate or to carry it for, you know, to maintain it. But, and we all, we refer to all of them as type. So sometimes it's like the Jusu library is, uh, it's kind of inventing a new library type. That description is correct, but it doesn't refer to the same definition of the term type that perhaps Rossi, Monero and, uh, and Venturi were interested in. So there is that aspect and that's why Wittler's text is important because he talks about three types. And, and in that text, I think both um, Maison Domino and, and to, to some extent the Nisian box is, is introduced as, as a second typology. But I also understand Nader's point about uh, Maison Domino not clearly uh, you know, being uh, a type or more of a kit of parts. But I also think it's also partly because of how it's it's been presented because we still don't know if that's a house or if it's a prototype for, for it is a prototype for production or it's also called a maison. So, but I think what, but it's fair to say that uh, Villa Savoie represents a type of a villa. Is it true? Not because of its specificity of, of, of but the fact that there's a parking under, you know, you have a, a PLOT, you have the, Car. And that, that thing keeps repeated in many cities. And uh, so that becomes a type. So Maison Domino may not be, but uh, Villa Savoie at some level registers a type of a yeah. villa. Yeah. And uh, so I, I agree with you on, on that completely. But there's also something about that I was trying to uh, think that uh, like the Portland, uh, John Portland uh, uh, atrium skyscraper. That's, that's not pressure of, you know, that's not other factors. That's an architect trying to imagine a new configuration, isn't it? Not in relation to history or not even in relation to the skyscraper. It's almost like that density was there in the table. He came up with the idea of expanding the atrium as a, and it's an invention of a time but it doesn't come from anything other than, you know, architect's imagination. And uh, no, I mean, I, I think the, the argument that Julian was placing about economic forces, real estate forces, he, he was the one architect that was able to translate the ex economic extremities of that moment into a new type. At least that's what Rem's argument is. I'm sorry. That's I, what Rem's argument, but I'm saying at any point that there, all of those forces are at play and somebody responds to them in alignment, 
we would be seeing more and more of, the, more and more of those things happening because it's almost like an evolution of, if you respond to existing set of condition, you should see it being repeated. But if only the architect, like John Portman or BRK. Portman produced- it's being repeated. Architects that did those, yeah. Yeah, whether you I like mean, it But it's being repeated, so it, it, it meets the condition of the time. No, no, if I'm saying it does meet, but I'm saying it's not because it, like how, I, I don't think by the way, that repeats that many. Like most of them are port, portments, no? No. There are many? There are many. Yeah, actually, yeah, actually that's really good. Well, one other clarification I wanted to make and, and just- but, but can, I, can I just point out, I don't think it's a pressure, it's an invention of a type that was good and keeps getting repeated. But it wasn't the pressure. Like it's not that suddenly forces of society gets resolved through the genius of an architect to a solution uh, that wasn't dependent on, on finding that solution through reorganization of, uh, of elements. And that's where the architecture, no. think, and sometimes they find something, but it's dependent on so much uh, technological, uh, it's again, so costly, but again, they have found something like the like Jusu library or Yokohama terminal, again, as type is invented, but may not get repeated because those set of conditions are not, are too expensive to, to repeat. But the invention is there, you know? You bring up Jusu again, and I'm thinking through the way that uh, Qian Yang built the argument through the Maison Domino. Uh, and if you look at Jusu and the Seattle library, my contention is that they're inventive, not because their transformation of the, uh, of the domino frame. Okay. They're inventive because they're a transformation of the parking garage. The parking garage is the most deterministic building type uh, that you can think of because the car literally has to roll up and down the building. The moment you misadapt it to civic space or a civic program like library, it's at that moment where it takes on a different vocation in the context of a, a discussion about typology. Um, and in the same way, Nima, I would say that the atria of Portman are typological transformations in that they take the skyscraper, the tower diagram of New York City, which pins the core smack in the center of the building and then begins to diminish the profile of the building in relationship to the sun and the air. And it hybridizes it with the deep plan at the base, the narrow plan at the top, and most importantly, the decentered elevator, because at no point can the elevator be in the center again. Yes. No, I agree that. So we, no, I agree that that, that, that is an invention. I'm just trying to, to separate uh, different ingredients that are at play in these inventions and... and well, what it's interesting about that example and, and that there's description is, it goes back to, to one of the fundamental quality, qualities of type that Monet expressed, which is the relationship between elements in, in the type. And the moment in which that relationship between different elements changes, then a new type is generated. So the moment in which the relationship of the elevator to the perimeter of the building and so forth is changed, then the new type is generated. And from that point of view, you would say that, you know, uh, domino is also a type because the relationship between the structure and the facade of the building changes from anything else that was happening before. So that produces a new type on, onto itself. In, in that sense, the Knights of Columbus building in New Haven uh, illustrates your argument well, in, in the sense that it takes the classical tower with the core in the middle, and it does exactly the opposite. It, it puts all of the cores at the corners, and it evacuates the, the center of any of those uh, functional attributes. I think Khan does that in other uh, moments also, but... Would you, is that what you're describing, yeah, Jan? Yeah, exactly. I think I would just jump in a little bit to say that, you know, uh, you know, we, we kind of, you know, jump out of the historic time where, you know, in inventions of absolute, I'm not absolute, but inventions of uh, 
completely new types, things like uh, Brunelleschi, Brunelleschi's dome and uh, uh, domino or um, even, you know, uh, let's say the invention of the parking lot in some way. Um, if we focus on research, let's say the teaching research in the studio, um, I don't think the, you know, our two speakers are that concerned about invention of a total new type because there, 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 there are moments where an invention of a new object does not necessarily constitute a type like, uh, uh, you know, Gateway Arch by Errol Saarinen in St. Louis. There's no other building in the world that will stuck an elevator inside an arch uh, along with a tram. It, it's one and, and, you know, it is in itself and it does not constitute a definition of a type. Um, you know, I, I'll probably say the similar thing for the, uh, uh, the vessel recently at Hudson. So there, there are moments where there are, you know, interesting inventions where you misplace things uh, that are unique and, um, you know, they are iconic and they're important precise because they, they're not a type. They cannot be repeated. Um, but I think that is a result of, you know, this pursuit of newness. Let's say I would not necessarily think that the newness are what to be struck. I'm not saying, I'm not saying you're implying that, but let's say um, there are a lot of moments where um, completely new, new types are not necessarily generated. There are only moments of uh, adjustments within a given type that deviates from his ideal position that, you know, that creates tension between the original thing and the, the other, um, you know, I think, um, uh, we're working on, uh, third year analysis is, is working on starting right now. There's a lot of interesting stuff with this, uh, you know, transformation of Schenkel, uh, and even arguably the Palladio diagram. So, um, I, I want to steer in, you know, the conversation a little bit towards what, um, these two years of teaching research at Cooper had, you know, uh, foster interest in practice or vice versa. I I can tell you this. I think you you. I don't know because it's it's a combination of newness, but through the body of the old, and it's not just the idea of the old, but the body of. That's why I was trying to make a point about the original plans versus the idea of a let's say, forty one mosque or a basilica, because there's always something extra there that has become quite productive in the work, and. Uh, so that's, that's one aspect of it. And it's true that, but it, overall, uh, because the set of operations are extremely, this is the conversation we always have, that we, the, the, you know, in a way, the two sets of collages that we do are, are they compound their effect when they, you know, when they synthesize as the third uh, three-dimensional uh, project. And they create moments of unrecognizability for the architecture. And the question is, and also an, a kind of a difficult understanding what happened to the original logic of transformation, because at the moment that they become, uh, they're at the moment of the crossbreed happens, it becomes this, this thing that is very hard to recognize. So in a way, sometimes new things have been generated, whether through sheer geometric uh, force of marrying things together, uh, as it has not been the case of working a kind of conscious working the way, for example, now there was right now, imagine reworking of ingredients of a skyscraper plan. It was never that kind of careful uh, recalibration or rejigging of ingredients. It was always through two radical acts and in combination that sometimes creates things. But it's also, there is something extremely instructive in reading that, I think we've all learning that reading the transformation through the step-by-step -step documentation of it has become quite helpful in understanding how you ended up somewhere, how far you could go back to more meaningful moments to, to stuff. So there is a kind of, a kind of a live set of operations that the thing that you see has some kind of connections to the original buildings that also represented types. So to me that, that that kind of range of ingredients gives enough both new things and also dealing with the repeat, repeat, repeatability of a theme like type and also physicality of an existing work that is always richer than the idea itself. I think that there's also, um, you know, the challenge with, with these operations and, and, and 
looking at the presidents and trying to find a way to create a hybrid between them is that I think even more and more it becomes important that uh, there's kind of a, a closer reading to the um, let's say the the vocabulary of each one of these uh, types of presidents, meaning that a wall or a column or a tectonic element uh, should be taken as such during the process of mixing them. And this is part, again, of an ongoing conversation um, because it helps to, um, you know, bring that issue of, of uh, the real in a good way, not in a bad way. I'm not talking about uh, pragmatism or anything like that. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about the significance of certain things that you should be aware of before there is a process of, of hybridization to prevent precisely um, going up uh, in, in kind of a strange directions and having to clean up uh, things. And, and to me, that's kind of the relevance of the structure and the tectonic aspect uh, as, a, as a consideration first for these types. Uh, so that if you are dealing with a basilica with a dome, and then you take that component, uh, you should be taking that, uh, considering that is a dome. And, and if you slice it, or you remove the walls, or if you flip it, or if you rotate it, then there has to be something that you do in terms of your operations for combining it that will compensate for the lack of support for that element, for example. Um, and those could become, I think, moments of invention um, when, when the hybrids are created. But, if, but it's almost like taking, taking a score of, a, of a, um, a symphony are trying to mix it with, you know, uh, you know, PDD, whatever, you know, a score. Uh, you cannot just take take it uh, and, and combine it uh, by looking at the at the notation. You have to understand that each one of these notes, chords, represents uh, music. There's a flow. There's a structure to it. That it can be changed. It can be transformed. But it should be recognized before you you mix it. Before you hybridize it. Last, I might want to uh, direct this conversation to a place where um, I think Nima mentioned at, at the very first when I mentioned cool houses, when, you know, when, when things don't actually align, you know, uh, when tectonics are not that honest or probably shouldn't be honest you know, from the first place, uh, is when this, you know, reality of the structure and the image of supporting uh, produced uh, through uh, geometry, um, you know that this that mismatch is has been you know at play for many centuries, and then um, Nima, as a person who I know made a lot of fake vaults, uh, <laughs> taking geometric delights in there. Um, I, I, <laughs> I think we talked about it in, in uh, last semester's lecture where um, you know not only I think a lot of architects today also you know the iconography of a of a roof or of a you know, uh, of a vote um, unsupported um, by, by on one side or, you know, it's deviating from the Corbus more, uh, model, is deviating from Kant's Kimball, but it holds some sort of conceptual clarity there that we're trying out. We're kind of breaking out of that idea of things have to be true, to, uh, you know, exactly true. Um, I don't know what, um, you know, is that when things are, the, the most interesting things emerges or is it like, you know, um, I think uh, I'll just make the last example of like, um, let's say when Khan is doing the Kimbo Museum, um, everybody's focusing on the, on, the, on, on the vaults, but actually when he's dealing with the, um, with the stones on the exterior and the interior, uh, they're stacked as if they're solid stones. But actually, if you look at the type of that stone, you know, it's pretty expensive. It's not going to be solid at all. I'm pretty. I'm not sure about the background of the deers. Is that solid or not? Probably solid. Um, but in in Khan's case, it he revealed that this, the the fakeness of that cladding 
despite the fact that he, he stacked it like um, uh, like bricks, the way he does that is on the interior of the of Kimbo, um, the, the, the stones did not touch the floor. So he actually lived the, the air venting space between the floor and the stones. There's kind of this, you know, people's analysis of him is like, oh, he's dishonest, therefore he has to tell the truth somewhere in there. Um, um, so, you know, I'll, I'll just hand this discussion to uh, Nima and Palacio, perhaps in a day or two. Well, I, you know, I don't think it, it, it's necessarily about honesty, full honesty, direct honesty. I, I think there's a real power in ambiguity of things. Um, and, you know, that, that's why I, I'm kind of fascinated by, even though it looks very structural, Artiga's columns, they seem impossible because of the way in which they are touching the ground. Or, and they are actually oversized for a lot of his projects because they, they, they are kind of a, an image of a massive structure that is not even uh, needed to that extent. It's too muscular for what it needs to do. So there's, there's, a, there's an, uh, an agenda there that is different from pure and true uh, efficiency in terms of, of the structure. I think uh, part of the issue to me is to what extent you can present that as something that can be revealed in the experience of the architecture itself, right? Or if it's just something that uh, you never discovered the trick. And I think it's more interesting when, when there are clues along the way that allow you to discover the trick versus just assuming that the vault that you are seeing is a true vault. And, and then you never are exposed to, to the trick. You never have the opportunity to go in there and actually say, well, you know, this is not a vault. Quite interesting now, because I thought it was a vault, a vault from, from below. So, so to me, it, it, it engages kind of the experience of architecture. And I think the 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 trick that or the tricks that we play to make things look like they they are other things is part of what we do as architects and part of the narratives that we create but we have to find a way to uh, through the experience communicate that otherwise um, and communicate it to people who experience the building other than than architects who are looking at the section and then can review, can then you know question themselves is like what's going on in this very thick, uh, empty space. So. And uh, just one thing, because you mentioned I know Nima very closely, and he is responsible of many fake arches. And <laughs> <laughs> don't use uh, intimacy as a way of coming. <laughs> no, it's it's a fair comment. <laughs> No, no, but it's it's interesting that you use both intimacy with me and 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 come back to me. But uh, <laughs> but uh, I personally think that discussion about you know the value of uh, I think it's one of those exhausted conversations that I don't want to land. If it's true, I'm responsible for many fake arches. But it's it's uh, I'm that discussion about whether it's real or whether like that nuance has been explored so much that it's not so much there to offer. I can just defend this thing in in real life that whatever whatever project we are given, we try to shove some kind of formal, some kind of uh, radical transformation of the of the spatial organization to the framework of the question. And to me, it would be more interesting if it was a fake plan, it was a round plan that the, the plan was a square in the middle, like a, some kind of duality like that, that is more experienced than a duality of, of that. So those are more interesting things. And we would have done that. But um, that's why, so we always do that. That's why I'm, I'm saying, uh, and that's why I'm always a bit suspicious of this synthesis project, projects that are assuming that things would generate, like there is a social, economical, or technological logic suddenly would invent the new. That's why, that's why I always say, like we could have pushed the idea of, of, a, of some kind of change that is purely formal 
and we could have, and we should have, and sometimes it doesn't come along, find other uh, logics and other more meaningful things to combine it with. But the only way of doing it is first to do the first act. That's, that's, that's the part that I'm trying to delaminate between the synthesis project that is a bit optimistic about everything's coming at once, or the reality that we just put so many of these things that hopefully some of them become more supported with, uh, you know, thicker logics. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, if I can just say that what is interesting about this exchange, uh, even more than the position that you're taking, is the shame that you display, despite the fact <laughs> that one would never associate you with the kind of moral orthodoxy that is embedded in the question. In other words, uh, I would have thought you would celebrate the fakeness of your arches rather than in some way acquiesce to a kind of guilt. So that's something I don't understand because centuries of discussions around tectonics have been privileged not around the, the project of synthesis, but the project of priority. Knowing fully well that architecture's uh, problems are composed of many contingencies, different architects select uh, criteria out of the basket of, of the mess that is the architectural process, uh, sublimating certain moments to become thematic or, or somehow uh, extraordinary. And, uh, and in doing so, uh, defining a position for that building somehow. But I, so I, I guess, I guess I'm, I'm trying to, out of the humor of your reaction, I'm trying to understand why the morality all of a sudden? Why are you, the mannerists of all of us, uh, so sheepish in, in regards to the question? No, there are more exciting mannerisms out there. I'm tired of old mannerisms. There are mannerisms of plan, there are mannerisms of many kind. That this one is the one that I, yeah, it's, it's the one that it seems to have exhausted all of the positions around it. Uh, you know, it still adds a certain, you know, it has a certain experiential thing, but it doesn't, it's almost like mannerists also change mannerism. And I just think some of the conversation that we have, or some of the, like the, the you know, the themes of, of the work sometimes uh, gets more interested in other ways of doing fake things that are more exciting than the ones that are already all sides of it are taken. So in a way, even if that was a thin shell, real, uh, like pieces of precast or stone, I wouldn't be interested in expressing how a thin shell was kind of inserted into a, a kind of a shed building, because that conversation is, is done, is all aspects of it are gone. But I think what we are exploring in this studio and mostly here with, are, are, um, are explorations of things that are not what they used to be anymore. So in, in a way that, that kind of thing is there. Sometimes we see a dome that is on the side radically. It just seems to be a bigger, bigger expression than those nuanced ones that always fall in the same place. That's the only thing. But even if you do that, then you, you have to take ownership of that and explain, you know, if it's a dome flipped on its side, then you know what what's the what what's the follow up to it um but it's more yeah. exciting but it's more exciting it's at some point not exciting as a like it's it's uh, a dome on this like that's why when we did the dome on the side that the, the conversation came off actually you know elizabeth mentioned what happens to a dome on the side it wouldn't function and then we started thinking about the degrees of reality and fakeness of a sided dome that is open. Yeah. I just okay. think that the sided dome has, has not been quite explored, but a thin shell barrel vault, for example, all parts of it are kind of taken. I think I asked a question, like I use Nemo as the target, but I know it's, it's already exhausted in this part. My, my point was to bring out some yeah. more interesting uh, conversation from Julian and Nadera in particular. <laughs> No, now, now I know why there's not a, a space above that fake vault that Nima showed the other day. Yeah, he, yeah. He's, he's, he doesn't want to... It's the same answer. <laughs> like, imagine if there was an, 
imagine if there's a fake ball and on top of it, there's a space of use. I think there are, those positions are, the more radical versions of it are done are not convincing anymore because they all were generated by a desire to do the art, the evolve. So, uh, I, I think that the question you're asking is a difficult one because in great part, the discussion uh, around tectonics more often than not deals with the problem of language. And, and I think to some degree, the, the arguments uh, of the 60s and 70s unite in some way around the notion that um, uh, typology maintains a relative autonomy from problems of language, iconography, program, and, 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 and therefore it becomes more configurational. So my example for you would be that uh, Plechnik church that is uh, uh, basilical in its original organization, but as he moves the columns uh, on the axis of the nave and the side aisles reveals organizational principles that are more like an amphitheater. The moment that the amphitheater is superimposed with the basilica it is, it is a moment of invention. And the moment invention was sparked by Plechnik moving columns in, in an asymmetrical fashion around the two rails that allowed for that amphitheater to emerge. Uh, that to me is a, is a great example for your question. It, it zooms out, not, it zooms out from the detail, but uh, allows for uh, the part to whole relationships of columns, vaults, and the morphology of the building to take on a different characteristic because of the moving of certain uh, elements. Okay, sorry for scratching for this long, uh... Are there any questions from the audience? I know they're like, it's about seven minutes to a 3 p.m. class, but okay. we can take it. Moments of silence. It's, uh, it's, it's interesting that uh, Nadir jo uh, joined the conversation in the middle unplanned, but I think it worked out pretty, pretty well. Um, you know, uh, um, I think if there's any questions, you, we, we can ask it right now. Uh, you, you can just chat it out right now. Um, my hunch for the for, for this conversation is actually uh, very interesting, and and then um, maybe next time what we could do is also um, you know allow people to let's say intrude when uh, we kind of try to dissolve the barrier between the panelists and the questions uh, and answer section of it. We're still gonna give, give a mark of it, but I think more participations can be more interesting. Okay, um, so we're all good, no questions? Okay, uh, thank you so much for joining the first uh, of the In Conversation Shared series. There'll be more, so just, uh, look up to our newsletter sent by our dear uh, Mauricio. And then we'll also have Instagram posts around to make sure people get uh, the news. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank Wonderful. you. Thank you everybody.